can we heal, fix, repair someone or a condition that we as a society refer to as a disease or I'm an alcoholic? Let me put it another way. There are millions of people all over the world saying, I have a disease, I'm an alcoholic. What I would submit is maybe what they mean or maybe what they could amend from a verbiage point of view is say instead, I am experiencing an alcohol use disorder. Absolutely. Or I have an alcohol use disorder. Now, to me, that's a temporary affliction as opposed to I'm an alcoholic, I have a disease. That to me implies that they can't do anything about it. They genetically inherited this disease and they're an alcoholic, therefore they can't drink under any circumstances or their life goes to hell. I guess my question is, are those people who are saying that wrong? Are they mistaken? And can we actually, through behavioral neuroscience, is what you've studied, get them to see that they can change their behavior and instead say, I have a temporary inability to consume alcohol in a healthy manner? Well, that's my dream. I've dedicated, I am dedicating my life to trying to achieve that. Uh, I'm afraid I may, I may not be successful, but I really hope as a community we will eventually. Uh, so there are, there are two questions in your question to some extent. Is an alcohol use disorder or a substance use disorder a chronic illness? Is it a disease? Uh, and can we treat it? So when someone has cancer, someone has a disease. And it's not genetically, necessarily genetically inherited. And yes, we can treat cancer. And someone can be cancer free. So having a disease doesn't mean that you have it for life. If you have diabetes, right now we do not have the technological means to treat diabetes in a way that we can we cannot make someone with diabetes diabetes free. We are yet at the very early stages of considering that we can make someone with a alcohol use or substance use disorder, alcohol use disorder free. As a matter of fact, of course, individuals who've been diagnosed with an alcohol use disorder, there's, there's a way out. Which way it is for each individual, I cannot tell you because it's very t personalized and tailored to the individual. But it's it's not true that you know you you stuck in you stuck in it. Yet I'm going to tell tell you something that you may find very um, difficult to hear. But someone with the diagnosis of an alcohol use disorder is a bit of a kind of lifetime diagnosis because research and epidemiology have both shown that if you have a diagnosis of alcohol use disorder. That is, you are always at a greater chance of relapsing than someone who has not yet developed a disorder to, de to develop it. And the best treatment there is so far in terms of clinical outcomes is abstinence. And I, I praise individuals who engage in abstinence and maintain abstinence because they have overcome for a very long period of time the urge to re-engage in alcohol use, whatever the reasons why they want to re-engage in it, but they have not yet recovered the freedom to use. And the real clinical outcome would be to give people the ability to consume without taking the risk of losing control all of a sudden again, which is very likely what happens even after years of abstinence. So we are not there yet, but I really hope that in 25 years, by today I retire-ish, we may well have better tools to enable individuals to regain control over the behavior. And I'm not very satisfied with the idea that someone who has lost the freedom to say no, we give, as an alternative, we give them the absence of freedom to say yes. That is not exactly the right clinical outcome. It is, the, it is much better for the individual 
of course, it's safe. We are not to drink alcohol at all. And if the society decide, if society decides not to drink alcohol at all, that's fine. That would be what everyone does. But that's not where we are at the moment, at least. So, um, someone with an alcohol use disorder is not just a transient, transient thing. If they are actively using, yes, it can be deemed transient because there's hope that at some point they'll be able to stop. But that, at that time, they'll be abstinent. So for someone who has challenges with alcohol, shall we say, is moderation a myth? I wouldn't say it's a myth because that would be suggesting that there hasn't been a single human being who has not achieved that, which is not the case. But that is at least in all the current clinical programs of which I know, that is not the the outcome that is thought by the clinician. The outcome is abstinence because we still do not know how to accompany people to regain control. We still do not know how to do that. Of course, some people will be able to do it by themselves sometimes, and with particular, with the help of their peers, relatives, a particular AA, for instance, may well help. But this has not been studied enough, and there's no trend extracted from these very personal experiences that would enable me to tell you, this is what you do. No, but we are not there yet. What is the best clinical way to treat someone with an alcohol use disorder? Well, I'm not a clinician, but it would first be to understand them and to discuss with them why is it they take the drug. And then often, in many cases, there will be different stages. The first stage will be to recognize, to help the individual recognize that they have an alcohol use disorder. And sometimes it's not something that is trivial to recognize that we have a problem with alcohol. Secondly, try to help them identify the roots of their use. In, under which circumstances did they first engage in problematic use? Uh, have they always used a lot? Have they always used in a particular pattern, in particular circumstances, in a specific psychoaffective state or emotional state? And and then that requires a combination of psychotherapeutic intervention and the, the help of a couple of drugs which have you know, some therapeutic potential. Most of the drugs that work relatively well would be drugs that interfere with the endogenous opiate system, such as naltrexone, for instance. Uh, but these drugs have side effects that some individuals are not willing to uh, experience, even for the benefits of, of treatment. So it's it's a very individual experience. The way there's no recipe, there's no standard protocol. There are standard protocols for rehab, but if rehab worked very well, then people would not see relapse. So there is a standard protocol, and then it all depends on the individual, their motivation, their past experience, and a real a real tailored, personalized approach, which nowadays lacks a biological understanding of the disorder. My hope is one day we'll be able to identify biological markers that will enable us to identify the right strategy for the individual at that moment in time. Again, we're not there yet. If you'll allow me, I'd like to share a little bit about uh, my organization and our attempts to help people to stop drinking alcohol. Uh, the organization that I head is called uh, Alcohol Free Lifestyle. We have a 90 day stop drinking program and process, which is called Project 90. In Q1 of 2023, the University of Washington and Seattle in the United States conducted a scientific study on our 90 day stop drinking process. We had 163 participants and they went through our process for helping folks stop drinking alcohol. The results were a 98% reduction in drinking from folks going through that process. Um, now I'm happy to walk through 
what we do to try to coach our folks and rewire their mindset around alcohol. But before I do that, I want to compare that to what I've read regarding Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm not here to you know, criticize AA. I just want to use it as an example. So AA has a reported 7% success rate yeah. in terms of helping people get at least a year power over their drinking habits. You're nodding your head in approval, which means you're aware of the limitations of, say, AA. So I guess my question is, what would lead one process to result in a 98% reduction in drinking and another process results in a 93% failure in reducing drinking? Like, I know you just kind of touched upon, you know, it's an individual prospect, but is there anything that we can surmise based on two different group dynamics having such completely different results? Well, I, I, I would find it very difficult to answer that question right now because I would need to have a look at the data, per se, and, um, and try to understand whether some individuals or most of the individuals in your program have completely stopped or whether all of them have decreased and began control. If that is the case, this is incredible. Um, and, uh, and I wish... I I wish I had been involved in that study because it, it is groundbreaking. Um, then what is the extent to which the participants in your program and, and the very wide and diverse community that is enrolled in AA differ? Are there more severe individuals in one than the other? Uh, are the individuals in AA you know, characterized by having more comorbid elements. So of, of, often alcohol use disorder or substance use disorder are not isolated disorders. They come with a constellation of other psychiatric conditions called comorbid conditions, such as abnormal anxiety or pathological anxiety or depression or PTSD. To what extent were the populations different with regards to these comorbid elements? Can you predict? the response to treatment when a particular type of individual enters a program, uh, that, that I think would be incredibly useful to know. Um, at face value, I take it and I think it's amazing. I, I, I don't have enough data to be able to actually scientifically, critically assess the discrepancy between both. But clearly AA helps some. I think it's never harmed anyone. But uh, but there are clear limitations to these kind of approaches to alcohol use disorder, yes. Yeah, I'd be happy to send you the white paper oh, yeah. that the University of Washington produced yeah. as a result of that. I have my own hypotheses as to why it was so successful. It, it, and it includes a couple of things, which I'll reference here because maybe it triggers a thought from you. Uh, we really uh, identified people who, are, who identify as high performers. So let's say an entrepreneur or an executive. It was a specific like-minded group of people. And I think that differs from, say, going to an AA meeting where you might be an entrepreneur or an executive, but you're sitting next to a 19-year-old meth addict who's holding up gas stations and had, has had 17 DUIs, who's been arrested five times or been to prison. How can you relate to Absolutely. that person? Absolutely. Whereas our methodology really does curate a specific demographic of person. So I'm wondering, based on your research, how important is stopping drinking or overcoming any addiction in a like-minded group of people? Not just a group of people, but a like-minded group of people. Have you seen any data to suggest that that is incredibly more effective than the alternative? Well, I guess here it would be the interaction of the characteristics of the population and the nature of the program. It could well be the case that your program may not work at all on another population. I wish it did, but it may not work on a different population. So um, it is not clear to me how we can identify specific programs that would be administered to identified populations without prior experience. So here, you in your case, you've established a very strong proof of principle 
that your program administered to a particular population of individuals who have AUD uh, works very well. And, and that is one of the problems of the clinical and preclinical research on substance use disorders is that there never is, at least objectively, consideration of a subpopulation that may well respond more than another in a particular clinical trial. What we look at is whether there is a, an effect or not of whatever the treatment is on the population. Um, and we may need more granularity in the way we assess the therapeutic potential of whatever treatment we want to develop and see whether we can identify subpopulations that respond extremely well. In your case, it's been designed, perhaps the program was designed to target these populations for, uh, for the future, that may well be the, the way we need to go. Determine populations that respond more or better than others and see whether we can find biological or behavioral determinants that characterize that population such that when the treatment is administered, what you call like-minded could be people sharing similar neurodevelopmental profiles in terms of interactions between genes and environment. See, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be social cultural. It can also be biological or behavioral. A lot of research needs to be done there. I'd love to make available the study results to you and hopefully it can be a catalyst for ongoing research in your endeavors. Uh, I want to do a quick fire round here. I have um, some clients who've successfully stopped drinking now for at least 12 months and they're in our leadership program. So we have three programs. There's Project 90, Beyond 90, and then for those who've completed a year alcohol-free, they go into this leadership program. And they have sent me some questions that like me to ask you in just quick fire, rapid uh, pace as we head for home here. Uh, this question came in, what is the general time frame to see the brain recover from long-term alcohol use disorder? It depends on the alterations in the brain that you are looking at. Um, for instance, by alter altering the dopamine system, alcohol exposure results in a decrease in the level of expression of a particular type of receptor called the dopamine digital receptor. And uh, after three months, you start seeing a rebound. Uh, there are other alterations, which are, for instance, the actual size of part of your brain. So the prefrontal cortex kind of shrinks a little bit when you take too much alcohol. And the part of the brain that is important for habits gets slightly bigger. These alterations take six months to three years to um, to disappear. But of, of all the studies of which I am aware, I am not aware of everything, it seems that the time frame of three months to two years is more than sufficient to see the brain recover from chronic alcohol use. Some alterations that may remain hidden will take longer, especially if alcohol use was so severe that it resulted in metabolic disease, such as liver disease, then the liver disease will maintain alterations in the brain, which cannot recover for as long as there is a liver disease. So there's, there's a distinction to be made here between the actual effects of alcohol on the brain and the long-term consequences of alcohol on the body, which then has an effect on the brain. So 90 days seems like the shortest duration of time to be yes. able to really repair the brain and for some of some of the adaptations yes okay got it what impact does nutrition and exercise have on the recovery process from an alcohol use disorder um massive as a matter of fact um exercise may well be key to a adapt adapted and adaptive emotion regulation in each one of us so, you know, we've, we've discussed that some people would pour themselves a glass of wine when they feel bad in the evening. Well, it's, of course, much more adaptive to go for a run. And, uh, and exercise is going to influence metabolism in the brain. It's going to be boost the machinery that produces fuel for the neurons. It's going to result in an increase in secretion of um, what are called growth factors, which are very important for a healthy brain, much more than anything else. Um, healthy and healthy diet is going to contribute at least equally to a fast recovery as exercise. 
So um, alcohol is going to perturb all the mechanisms involved in respiration in the body and the brain. It will interfere with um, all the mechanisms in the liver important for metabolism of many uh, molecules. And healthy diet is going to help the brain recover all the nutrients that are necessary to rebuild the circuits in the brain that have been interfered with by alcohol. It's nice to have the growth of the growth factors, but the brain needs the building blocks to rebuild itself and a healthy nutrition will enable that to occur faster. May I submit a third important factor besides yeah. nutrition and exercise? Accountability. Yeah. And by that I mean a group of like-minded people who hold you accountable to actually exercise and to actually eat well because anyone can go on YouTube and watch an educational program or video that says eat better, exercise more. I think we all logically know that, but yet we don't do it. We don't do it because these are habits that um, are costly to implement or to acquire. You need to carve out time to exercise. And, uh, and surprisingly enough, if you want to eat healthy, you need to have a time as well to cook and prepare nice meals. Uh, it's, it's easier to spend two hours you know, scrolling your phone and having a burger than going for a run, coming back home and start cooking fresh vegetables. Um, so yes, it's, it's easier to say than to do, but accountability will enable the individual to acquire the habit faster and consolidate it. And as soon as it's consolidated, it's part of their daily routine. And then it comes at no cost anymore. Um, so I fully agree that it, it is important to provide support for someone who spent a lot of time drinking alcohol and actually because all of the time was related to drinking the drug alcohol or foraging for alcohol or recovering from the effects, less time was dedicated to activities that are that were considered irrelevant. So you need to rebalance, revalue these alternative activities, which in individuals with who do not have a substance use disorder are already activities we tend to put on the back burner. It's important to promote them and to enable individuals to engage with them. So yes, accountability is indeed a very important aspect. Yeah. This is a question from one of our leadership clients. And for context, uh, she experienced a lot of trauma when she was younger. She was involved in a university campus shooting. She survived this mass shooting and she experienced a lot of trauma. And so her question is, what is your view on the supposed correlation between trauma and alcohol use disorder? Well, it's not a supposed correlation. It is there. Um, trauma is going to be associated with uh, negative affective states that most of the time uh, are experienced by the individual alongside an inability to engage in adaptive coping strategy because the trauma, trauma is so profound, then you know, exercising or engaging in healthy pursuits is not sufficient to overcome the pain. And then one may well engage in drug use because as we discussed, it is an easy way, or at least it is perhaps at that time, the only way to numb that pain. Um, the relationship between trauma in, in the neurodevelopmental period of someone in life and, and substance use disorder is massive. Um, some strategies that are burgeoning now, such as mindfulness, seem to have a promising, promising future for the treatment of substance use disorders or alcohol use disorder, because they may help individuals having spent trauma to reappraise that experience and break free from the iron clap, actually close it, it has on, on the individual. Trauma is something that actually makes you a prisoner of your past history. And uh, so there may well be new strategies, at least applied more recently to the field of substance use disorders that could help with that. 
Uh, another client here asks a question. How does the healthy mind manage risk assessment? Smoking versus wearing a seatbelt versus sun exposure versus drinking versus driving a fast car versus other high risk behaviors and what affects those decisions? So the question is, how does the healthy mind manage risk assessment? Well, that, that would take me some time to address because um, in many of these examples that were taken here, there is a interesting element which is called cognitive impulsivity or daily discounting. Uh, I can give you an, an everyday life example. Um, if, I, if I offered a large population of healthy human beings the choice between receiving 10,000 pounds in two weeks or 50,000 pounds in three weeks, or three, in three years. And let's say that this population is on, on the same socioeconomic scale. So none of these individuals need that money. There will be some individuals taking the 10,000 pounds in three weeks. The net result is that they've lost 40,000 pounds over a period of three years. Yes? Yes. Why? Because the value of things decreases over time. That is called daily discounting. It occurs across species and we are not immune to it. So if I tell anyone, if you smoke now, you may have cancer in 40 years. The heat I get now, I, I don't know what, what it is to experience the heat of smoking because I've never smoked, but the heat I get now overvalues this long-term consequence. Interestingly, if I'm not mistaken, I think you're from Australia. Aren't yes. You? Australia introduced another strategy for um, management of smoking, which is if you smoke now, you're ugly now. Hmm. If you smoke now, you're ugly now? Yeah, smoking makes you ugly. Smoking makes you ugly. And that was a public health strategy that worked much better than all the other strategies when you put pictures of lungs or throats 40 years down the line because the long-term consequences are, dis are discounted. So long-term consequences are discounted, but short-term consequences are absolutely given priority. Absolutely. So if I say, warning, stopping drinking alcohol makes you better looking, is that enough of a short-term reward to trigger people into stopping drinking alcohol? It may well work in those who have mild alcohol use disorder. As a matter of fact, all of these strategies, once again, um, they, they target those potentially at risk, those who have not developed the full-blown disorder. Um, but someone with a substance use disorder, smoking or alcohol, would not even pay attention to these messages. Mm. So, you know, they, they just, they, they, they would pay attention to the drug cues. So if you show them a pack of cigarettes, they won't see the pack. They, they picture what's inside. So they won't even respond to it. But um, one strategy to actually take, making sure that people would move away from alcohol is say, yes, if you drink, you'll, you, know, you won't have a beautiful skin or you won't have, or you have a red nose or right now. So uh, appealing to, to some extent, narcissism or self-esteem right now at least from the data we've had from the Australian campaign, works much better than the consequences in 40 years because it is irrelevant right now. So in some of the of the examples that were given by by your client here, you know, it's driving fast now, you know, dying. Well, the likelihood of dying dying is still small. If I've got a fancy car, driving nice is you know higher high arousal that I experience, that is what I'm going for now. So we need, so there are different types of decision making. How do we decide between two things right now that we can get right now? Or do, how do we decide between something now, immediate, and something that has a consequence in 40 years? So for instance, I can ask you if, you, if you, let's say you like a particular type of apple and a particular type of pear exactly equally, you like them both, so they have the same value. How do you choose? I, I just pick one because I pick one. Or perhaps because your body tells you that you need some vitamins that you only have in the apple and you're not aware of it. So, um, or you'd say, well, last time I had the apple, so I'm going for the pear. Mm. 
in any of these scenarios, you're not choosing based on the value of the thing. You're choosing based on the utility. And the utility fluctuates all the time. You know, the value of something is the very something. The extent to which in my current state, my brain and my body, the utility of that thing can change. The utility of having my seatbelt should be universal. But in some individuals, it may not be. But the utility of paying attention to pedestrians should be universal. The utility of alcohol right now, if I am someone with an alcohol disorder, will be greater than any other utilities. So I may engage in drug driving, not because the value, my moral values are wrong. It's because the utility of alcohol right now is greater than the rest. Because alcohol has changed my brain such that the utility of alcohol will always take precedence over anything else. So I'm no longer an healthy person making the decision, but we started off with an healthy person making the decision to how drugs can interfere with that. Mm. I'm just thinking from a marketing point of view now, my marketing brain is kicked into gear as it relates to helping people stop drinking, at least take action to reduce their drinking, is to really focus on the short-term dire consequences of their continued drinking. So maybe avoid or decrease the marketing that I use saying, hey, in 30 years, you're going to have liver disease. People go, yeah, okay, whatever. Instead, hey, you might lose your current job if you continue drinking. Hey, you might be heading for a divorce this year. Hey, uh, drinking alcohol makes you ugly right now. So the immediacy of the short term rather than the challenging consequences of the long term. Okay, great. Thank you. Two more questions here as we finish up here. We're talking to Professor David Berlin, Professor of Behavioral Neuroscience at Cambridge University, uh, who is a specialist in impulsive compulsive disorders, such as alcohol and drug addiction, although let's just call it drug addiction, which includes alcohol. I think that's a better way of saying it. Uh, Another uh, second last question here is from a client. What is the most important thing you want us to know about alcohol and how it affects us? Alcohol hijacks your brain in a way that you will no longer be the owner of your decisions. Hmm. Explain that. That it changes the way we compute information. It changes the way we compute utility of things. It changes the way we are conscious of our urges and it makes, it forces our brain to make decisions outside the realm of awareness or consciousness that will always be in the interest of alcohol. So you become a vessel for the perpetuation of alcohol drinking. That's what it does. And none of that sounds good. No. I, c- I could not trace the effects, the positive effects of alcohol because I can't see any positive effects. Since, as we discussed earlier, I do not know who may well be vulnerable to losing control over alcohol use. Or as long as I can tell it's safe for you now, it's not safe for you in two months because you've experienced this, or it's not safe for you now, I can't praise any positive effects of alcohol. I'm sorry. I mean, that seems shocking to me when we compare that to society's acceptance Absolutely. of alcohol. And my previous um, you know, I, I agreement that I myself drink alcohol, um, and, and I do not consider myself above anyone else. Um, I have rules around my own consumption perhaps due to my line of research, um, that which I believe, it's only a belief, we all work in a belief system uh, that to some extent protect me from uh, losing control. And uh, and because I've, I've done that many times, I, I would systematically stop my interaction with alcohol if I feel that there is something bad. But that's my line of research. I think about drugs. 16 hours a day, seven days a week, and I've done that for 20 years. Um, that That is not necessarily the case of everyone. So, um, no, there's alcohol is dangerous. 
all drugs are very dangerous. If, if there was no such thing as an alcohol use disorder, I would feel comfortable praising some of the effects of alcohol. But I do not know who it is I'm talking to, and I could not even tell them, even if I knew them, if they would be vulnerable to developing an alcohol use disorder. How can I praise it? I can't. What question haven't I asked you that you feel is worth asking? How can the close social cycle help someone with an alcohol use disorder? Uh, because many people who manage to become abstinent and stay abstinent for years and years often have not achieved that incredible feast on their own. And, uh, and this is where I believe it is very important that those who surround someone with an alcohol use disorder remember that stigma never helps and that understanding comes first and progressively introducing accountability and help acquire new habits. And sometimes that also comes with yourself as you know, a relative or someone in the first social cycle acquiring these new habits such that there's no mismatch between what is expected of the individual you want to help and what they can expect from you. And it is, it is a really important journey that not just the individual with an alcohol use disorder should engage in, but uh, I want to believe their immediate support should should be there to secure once abstinence has been achieved a protracted period of abstinence and you refer several times to a change in the mindset exactly the mindset is changed not just in the individual who's developed an alcohol so they should be changed in all those around them professor Berlin, thank you so much for your time thank you very much